Hi there. Welcome to Danny Neiman. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Maria. Thanks, Adam. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be talking about taboos from the jungle to the lab today, um, and we're going to be talking. We're going to be talking about some of the impediments to knowledge and uh, the production of knowledge and understanding what's going on in this wonderful world we've got. <clears throat> and afterwards, if you like, I will talk a little bit more about my own experiences with ayahuasca and my own experiences with divination around ayahuasca. But for the main part of the talk, I'm going to be not talking so much about what ayahuasca does to your brain, but what your brain does to ayahuasca and how we look at ayahuasca and how we think about it. We're going to be talking about knowledge today. And the whole body of knowledge is, a lot of it is to do with categorizing stuff and then applying rules that we know about it to stuff. So, for example, if I was to talk about what is, if I was to say what is ayahuasca, uh, what would we say? I'm going to start us off and I'm going to ask you to shout out some things. Ayahuasca is a liquid, which means you can't put it in your pocket. So we're going to categorize it with a whole bunch of other liquids and you have to put it in a bottle. Right, does anyone else know what ayahuasca is? Plant. It, to plant, excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so anything found in terms of plant. Anything else? Medicine. Medicine, good. Uh, divine being. S spirit. Yeah. A nurturing spirit. Excellent. So all these different ways of looking at ayahuasca give us different ways of thinking about it. And um, we can think about it in terms of, we can say it's hallucinogen, for example, which carries its own category and its own problems, because of course a hallucinogen means something which makes you see stuff which isn't there. So we're going to be talking about things around that and how scientific perspectives interrupt our understanding of ayahuasca, because ayahuasca is, ayahuasca is itself, that's what it is, and whether it's a divine being, I think it's a divine being, but that's my problem, that's not his problem. So let's get going, taboos from the jungle to the lab, uh, and let's just make sure we're on the same page about what a taboo is, and a taboo is an act which is culturally prohibited or extremely discouraged. So, for example, shouting out when someone is speaking is a taboo. <laughs> and today we're going to overturn that taboo in the quest for greater knowledge. So if you want to interrupt me, please interrupt me. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying, uh, you just go ahead. You can put up your hand if you want to be polite, or just don't, just interrupt me. Um, another taboo which I feel a little bit more conservative about is cannibalism. Um, this is something we don't tend to do in our culture. And generally messing around with corpses, uh, necrophilia, cannibalism, unless you're a member of the royal family, you probably don't do these kind of things. Um, but these are, I mean, it's a taboo, and it's an impediment to knowledge. I'm going to go to my grave, and I probably won't know what the taste of human flesh is like. But, um, so this used to be a broader taboo on messing around with corpses generally. For a very long time, uh, people didn't chop up corpses. So when people were studying anatomy, they had to study from these very old texts, from pre-Christian texts, when they were happy to chop up corpses, or they would study from monkey corpses and things like that. And so that meant some old errors were kept in the anatomical tradition, until a gentleman by the name of Vesalius came along in the 1500s, and he said, well, I'm going to chop up, I'm going to chop up corpses. He was quite a rude man, by all accounts. And I'm going to do it in the theatre. Um, so he would invite people to a theatre to come and watch him chop up corpses. And um, that's why we... We, uh, an operating theatre, it's called an operating theatre, because it used to take place in front of lots of different people. So normally we think in terms of overturning taboos as a way to greater knowledge, but there's another side to it, which is that taboos can also be repositories of knowledge. So for example, in the ayahuasca traditions, if you want to go and study ayahuasca as, uh, from the indigenous perspective, you're going to be subjected to a whole load of taboos. You're going to not have sex, for example. You're going to not eat sugar and a whole load of other things. So taboos can both impede knowledge, but they can also be stores of knowledge. And we're going to be talking about here, as I said, um, science and indigenous shamanism. And you can see from the picture that there's quite a lot in common that they have. <laughs> um, there's also a few, there's a great deal of difference as well, and the differences are a lot around taboo. And like I say, uh, we're talking about ayahuasca, because ayahuasca forms a bridge between these two things. Um, there's a lot of scientific studies going on into ayahuasca, neuroimaging, and uh, kind of long-profile psychological studies, and all kinds of anthropological studies. 
And we can get a, we can get an interesting view on how science works and how it doesn't work by comparing these two different knowledge systems. So let's get on it. Taboos in the philosophy of science. So we're going to begin talking about philosophy of science in 1620, when a gentleman by the name of Sir Francis Bacon invented the scientific method. Right? And he did this in order to make it possible for people to appreciate the, the nature of the world without the influences, without the filters which make it difficult for us to see. So he talks about four of them. I'm not going to go into it very, very deeply, but the, the prejudices of the tribe, the prejudices of the individual person, which made it... That's a taboo as well. Crying in a lecture is not done at all. Um, so Francis Bacon came up with the scientific method in 1620, and I'm going to tell you how it works. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Francis Bacon said about taboo as well. So this is how it works. This is what you do. Firstly, you would observe phenomena. So you say, okay, there's a swan, and there's another swan, and there's another swan. And you tabulate your data. This is how you generate scientific, scientific, scientific truth. When I say truth, I don't actually mean truth. So you tabulate your data. You say, okay, I've seen a swan on the 19th of November, and I saw another one on the 21st of November. And they're both white. And, and I saw another one, it was white. And when they're flying, they're white, and when they're on the, or on the pond, they're white. And in various different conditions and situations, this is repeatable, okay? Uh, they're white in summer, and they're white in winter. And then once you've got enough of these, you will see patterns, and you'll generalise a law, and you will say, all swans are white. And you can say you're a little bit more knowledgeable about swans. <laughs> Baconian inductivism, that's what he called it, the scientific method. So this is what he said about superstition, and he said, uh, he talked about a taboo. He said... There is a superstition in avoiding superstition, when men think to do best if they go furthest from the superstition formerly received. Therefore care would be had, that the good not be taken away with the bad, and the baby not be thrown away with the bathwater. He was trying to introduce a rational project into science, so he could think carefully about the world outside of superstition. But he appreciated that people were going to uh, look at a, something which seemed superstitious and say, well, we don't want to do that, not because it's not true, but because it smells a bit like something which is superstitious. I'm going to explain what I mean with an example. Yeah, so there's the, there's the first taboo we're going to be talking about. But Bacon's taboo, he tried to, he pointed out that there's a taboo against investigating all kinds of weird things which are a bit too magical. How does that work? Well, here's a taboo in science, action at a distance. You're really not meant to talk about action at a distance in uh, the medical journals, so on and so forth. So, in 1840, uh, having a child was a very dangerous affair. In some places, between 10 and 20 percent of women would die in childbirth, in some places more. Um, and that's tragic. It's quite easy when we're talking about history to detach ourselves from history and say, okay, these statistics, but these are, these are, these are orphan children and these are broken families, and so on and so forth. So, chap by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis noticed something. And what he noticed, he was a hospital, a hospital manager. And he, they, there were two wards in the hospital in which he worked. And he noticed that in ward one, 10% of the women died of this disease, childbed fever, after they'd, given, after they'd had a child. And in ward two, only 4% of women died. And no one knew why, they had no idea. And women would um, come into the hospital and they would beg to be let into ward two, and sometimes they'd have a baby on the street outside because they didn't want to go into ward one. And there was a good chance they wouldn't come out again. And the only thing he could find that was different between these two, as he was tabulating data in his Baconian inductivist manner, was that in Ward 1, no medical students were taken on the rounds. But in Ward 2, they were, it was just midwifery that was going on. But no one could understand why. And then one day, um, a medical student's scalpel nicked one of his friends. And the guy died of a disease, and they did an autopsy, and they found that actually a lot of things were similar about the way that these women were dying of childbed, childbed fever, and the way that this guy had died. Uh, it's what we would have called, what we call sepsisemia now. And so, what did he do? He he rethought his uh, he, he he rethought his table, and he organised he organised his thoughts a little bit differently. And he noticed another pattern, and that was that in one of the wards there were autopsy instruments, the other ward there weren't. That was the one where ten percent died. Um, and that was the one where the dead doctor had happened. And he didn't know why this happened, but he did think that there was something to do with how the doctors themselves and the medical students were passing on this disease from one woman to another. Uh, because what was happening was the medical students were messing around with corpses and chopping them up, um, and then they were 
were going to mess around with women and killing them. And there was no vector for this, because at the time, it was, uh, the theory of medicine was that it was an imbalance which made people sick. So that woman died because of something going on in her. And this woman died because of something going on in her. And there was no way that these two things could be related, because that's action at a distance, and that's magic, and we don't like that. So, several YC, well, first he introduced uh, hygiene, hygiene procedures. He made doctors wash their hands in between messing around with corpses and delivering babies, or in, or in between delivering one baby and another. And he was kind of ridiculed for this, but he managed to reduce the incidence of childbed fever to about 1%. But he still lost his job because of his strange theories. And um, things started to go quite badly for him then. He. Um, so he lost his job, and then he started writing increasingly irate letters to medical societies and journals, and then he started drinking heavily, and then he started visiting prostitutes. And then his wife and a bunch of doctors said, this guy needs to go to a mental hospital, and he did. And he got beaten to death in the mental health hospital. Um, yeah, and, and when he lost his job, actually, the mortality rate went right up again. Um, so a kind of tragic story, he was committed, and uh, he died. And in 1862, which was just three years before he died, uh, Louis Pasteur came along, and he came along with germ theory, and he said, you know what germs are, but he's, he said, they're little things which make you sick, and that's, that's how this one woman can affect another woman in another, another ward. But it's too late for him. Anyway, Semmelweis, he's remembered with statues, he's remembered as a, as a pioneer in hygiene. I'm going to tell you a more tragic story now. This is in the 1770s. Franz Anton Mesmer, and we're going to see how this same taboo against magical ideas has come into science and interrupted things. Now, Franz Anton Men Mesmer, he was prancing around in perfumed parlours in Paris, throwing women into fits, and uh, that was what his detractors said. And actually, it was true, that's what he was doing, but he was also curing them, um, some of them. And he did it with iron rods and animal magnetism. He said there was this invisible fluid which uh, acted between different bodies, and then he ditched the iron rods, and he was just uh, mesmerizing people with his hands as well. And this became quite a craze, quite famous. Louis XVI got into it, he was one of his patrons, but then he decided they needed a commission, because Franz Anton Mesmer had uh, said he would be able to cure a blind person, and he failed to cure him, and it all went wrong after that. So the commission went along, and they said, well... There is no invisible fluid, we can't find it. This is all humbug. Uh, but they released a secret report saying that this would be a threat to public morality, this kind of thing. So an expose was organised, um, and medical students dabbling in mesmerism were chucked off their course, and um, there was a big kind of movement against him, and he fled in disgrace. And we didn't really hear much about him, but mesmerism continued to flirt with respectability for quite a long time. And in 1842, Dr. John Elliotson gave a presentation to the Royal Medical Society in London. Now, he used to be the president of the Royal Medical Society. He was the pioneer of the stethoscope in England. Uh, he was also a founder of one of the London hospitals. This was a very well-established doctor. And he said to the assembled gentlemen, told us, told, uh, gave an account of someone who'd been hypnotised and had their thigh amputated. And the doctor said, uh, Dr. Elliotson, you must be mistaken. And so he wasn't perturbed. He continued and he studied himself, started doing his own operations. He lost all his academic posts. Um, and then in 1845, um, a gentleman by the name of James Esdell, now he, he worked in hospitals in Calcutta. And um, he'd never done any mesmerism, but he'd read about it. And he had this one particular patient who had a very, very painful testicle. And he said... Um, he decided he was going to try and hypnotise the guy, and he did actually hypnotise the guy. And then he introduced a hip, hip, hypnotic uh, anaesthesia into his, into his hospital. So basically what he did was he started to use hypnosis to treat a whole load of things, but also to do operations. And he, there was about a thousand operations performed under hypnosis. Uh, amputations of legs and arms, and cataracts, and penises, and all kinds of things. And the learned doctors in England said, of course, this is the weak-minded Hindu who is easily tricked. So we're starting to see how these taboos play out in the history of science. Um, they often become ways of defending authority, and we often see racism creeping in, which is going to be interesting when we start talking about ayahuasca, because of course the academic, is the, is the academy racist these days? I'd like to hope it wasn't. 
So back to the philosophy of science, right, so we're tabulating our data and all swans are white, but what happens when a black swan comes along? So Newton had a, an answer to this question, and um, he said, in experimental philosophy, we are to look upon propositions inferred by general induction from phenomena, that's Baconian inductivism, as accurately or very nearly true till such time as other phenomena occur, by which they may either be made more accurate or liable to exceptions. He had a way with words, Newton. So, to break that down, to paraphrase that, what he's saying is that we're going to say something is basically true, and we're going to think of it as true, until some data comes along which says it's not. And Popper gets the credit for this, Karl Popper, and his falsificationism. I dislike Karl Popper intensely, so let's leave it with Newton. And he said this, this is how you... Um, so this is the, the taboo which Isaac Newton tried to introduce into science when he was the president of the Royal Society. He said, I frame no hypotheses. That's because when he'd discovered the law of gravity, he had no way to explain why the law of gravity was happening. It was a mathematical law. So he said, hypotheses, whether metaphysical or physical, whether of occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. Occult, in this case, means hidden, the things that we don't really understand and we don't see. So what he's saying here is, uh, he's trying to introduce this taboo that we should not worry about our hypothesis and we should check our data and make sense of our data. So, just to recap, here's two taboos. There's Newton's taboo against letting your theory cloud your research. And there is Bacon's taboo against researching superstition. They're different types of taboos. Bacon's taboo is a bad taboo. This interrupts our quest for knowledge. Newton's taboo was a good taboo. It was to try to uh, make clear, make open our quest for knowledge. Is everyone following me so far? Okay, good stuff. So, let's see how these taboos play out, in, play out in history. In the 1870s, in Australia, uh, there were diphtheria outbreaks every, every so often, and they were horrific, horrific disease, really. You can see this. Um, again, history made very vivid. There's a man trying to keep his kid's throat open because diphtheria clogs up the throat. Of people. And one in 2,000 people died, which I guess doesn't sound like very much, but you read the reports and it's like some families would lose five children in the space of a week. And uh, medicine of the time could offer nothing for this, with the exception of Chinaman John's magic powder. Chinaman's John, Chinaman John is a generic term, generic name for any Chinaman. And um, Chinaman John's magic powder, it was uh, a bunch of stuff uh, mixed up, um, powdered, and fired down a bamboo tube into the person's throat, the person who had diphtheria. And these various Chinese doctors, they started having a uh, degree of success, and they were written about in the newspapers, and um, they were doing very well. So a, uh, a member of parliament who looked after a ward which had lots of Chinese immigrants proposed that we bring to bear the uh, modern science so we can investigate what exactly is going on here. And uh, so he proposed that a doctor by the name of R. Su be followed around by gentlemen medics and they see exactly what R. Su is doing. Good idea. But they weren't down with that. The physicians um, really didn't like this idea and what happened in the end was the physicians took his powder and they did it themselves. And they didn't have any idea of how it works, the way that this powder works, is through the far food thing, G. I don't know what that is. Um, neither did they, no one knew what it was. It was this very, very, it was another theory, another medical theory. So these trials were performed, and of course they failed. But the newspaper reports continued, and another trial was performed in the same year. This time it was a chemical analysis. This was performed by Dr. John, Dr. John Blair of Melbourne Alfred Hospital. This picture is not actually Dr. John Blair, this is a Cadbury's advert. Um, I put that up because I want us to not forget that science is sometimes used to sell us stuff, like uh, chocolate and Prozac and stuff like that. <laughs> Dr. Blair gave his expert technical interpretation of the facts, and he said, The Chinaman's powder contains nothing new. He gave a list of what it contains, musk, camphor, potash, and so on. He said, these things necessarily act as astringents, caustics, and escherotics. In the hands of an ignorant man, these local applications would be productive of a grievous amount of harm. Arsu is an ignorant pretender. So here we can see again these taboos 
coming in, the taboo against indigenous knowledge, taboos against other knowledge systems. So what happened? Well, this guy went on to scold the press and the public and parliament for believing in such unfounded nonsense as Chinese herbalism. And he went further and he got laws passed, which meant that any Chinaman calling himself a doctor who wasn't actually a doctor could be prosecuted. Arsu fled the country. So we're seeing, well, there's the taboo I was talking about, hypothesis and experimental science. This is what Newton said we should try to exclude from our empirical science. The idea that we know how something works before we try and work out how something works. And we're seeing these old familiar features of authority and racism. So, to bring us into the present, or slowly into the present, we're going to talk about how shamanism has been viewed in history. The first report of indigenous people using psychoactives was in 1571, and it was snuff. Being fired up the nose of uh, one indigenous camp to another. And these people who, had done, who did this, who were doing this, were called hechiceros. Hechiceros means sorcerers, right? Now, in the 16th century and 17th century, every single account of any indigenous practice does not fail to mention that they are sorcerers or practicing devil worship or something like that. And it's difficult to know if that's what the people actually believed or if they were just saying that, the anthropologists and Jesuits at the time, because this was happening in Europe. Women were being dumped in rivers to see if they were witches. And in the Amazon, the heathen was being converted. So we don't really know. When you read these anthropologists saying, look, I saw some devil worship going on, it, it might not have actually believed that. It might have been that he was uh, taking care that his work wasn't burned as heretical, or he himself wasn't burned as a heretic. In 1768, Iowa was, was described by a Jesuit by the name of Franz Xavier Weigel, who wrote, it serves for mystification and bewitchment. And then in 1851, the Tucano were observed using ayahuasca by Richard Spruce. Now, Richard Spruce is an exception to the rule. Richard Spruce was a wonderful botanist, uh, researcher. He went into the Amazon. When he arrived, he was already sick. He then spent 15 years researching uh, the plants and the customs and the traditions of these people. He learned 21 indigenous languages. 15 years later, he came out of the Amazon. His legs, he was paralyzed in both legs. He had intestinal uh, parasites, and he was deaf in one ear by the time. Um, a real fantastic guy, I think. Alfred Simpson, not so much. He talked about ayahuasca as an indulgence which usually results in a broil between at least the partakers of the beverage. <laughs> uh, I mean, being a member of the Santa Daime uh, tradition, I can kind of agree there's certainly something in what he says. But, anyway, he was astonishingly racist, this man. When you can read his, his, his writings, are hilarious. He talks about his guides as being the most villainous people he's ever met in his life. Um, I would wish to be borne in mind when savage customs are being treated of, of the inconsistency, vagueness, and superstition which pervade the savage's mind and actions. So let's have a little look at these savage customs. Beginning with Dieta. So if you decide you want to study ayahuasca as a, as a become a shaman, you're going to go off into the jungle and you're going to spend a whole bunch of time on your own. It could be six months, it could be a year. There are some tribes which say that next door tribe, which only spends six months, doesn't spend long enough, and that's why they have so many bruchos, that's why they have so many black magicians doing naughty things with their ayahuasca. It's a, a long period of isolation, no sex, no contact with people, uh, no salt, no sugar, uh, a whole load of... Um, Stuff which you can't do and you uh, you can't eat. Now, has that been studied? Hmm. Now let's compare that with scientific customs. We actually have a dieta in uh, in ayahuasca science, I guess. Does anyone know what you're not allowed to take if you're going to take ayahuasca? Antidepressants. Yes. You can't eat meat. Okay. So this is a traditional. Um, this is, yeah, there are certain meats that you can't eat, but this is in the traditional shamanic perspective. You won't, there's never been a scientist who has said, you can't eat meat, um, or done a study on that thing. But yeah, from a traditional perspective, yes. Uh, okay, um, there's a guy called Eddie Fresco, we're going to come on to that. Does anyone know something more general? Thank you. Yeah, okay, so um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or particularly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are antidepressants, right? If you decide you want to go along to a 
uh, Neo Ayahuasca Yoga Ceremony, or if you want to go to a Daimi Ceremony, or whatever it is, first thing they're going to ask you is, are you on antidepressants? And if you say yes, they will say, then you can't drink. And uh, this was two gentlemen by the name of Callaway and Grob, who proposed this in 1998. Both of these are excellent researchers. I really don't want you walking away thinking I'm anti-scientific, but I do think the science has some certain limitations which it should start to address. Now, Callaway and Grob proposed this, what, 17 years ago? Um, has any study been done on this? No. None at all, in fact. Is there any evidence for this? No, there is not a single report of any death or doubtless case of serotonin syndrome that could be attributable to ayahuasca and SSRIs. The UDV, which is one of the ayahuasca religions coming out of Brazil, they haven't observed this taboo, they think it's nonsense. And um, I actually know a psychiatrist who used to be with the UDV, and uh, he has plenty of patients who take antidepressants and ayahuasca. Um, but anyway, um, there's, there's no evidence of this at all. There's absolutely no evidence. This was the brainchild of two white chaps, and this has become pretty much dogma in ayahuasca studies. Now, the question arises, why are we listening to these two white guys with no evidence, and when we're not listening to hundreds of years of indigenous knowledge? Why, you know, why aren't we looking at the traditional dieta? And the traditional dieta, which Dr. Eddie Fresca, he's a brilliant, brilliant psychologist, Hungarian guy, um, he called it an overprotective but necessary warning. And he said this as well. The traditional ayahuasca diet recommends a type of banana which would theoretically be prohibited by the MAOI type potato diet. What he's saying there is that the way that indigenous people do it is actually, it doesn't fit with the way that we say it should be done. There's two different knowledge systems. One says one, one says the other, and they're incompatible. So which one do we defer to? These two white guys. The diet may serve a very rational function to increase brain serotonin by tryptophan uptake. So we even provided a, uh, a mechanism for this. Has this been studied? No, it hasn't been studied. Is it difficult to study this kind of thing? I don't think it's very difficult. I think you just give rats a whole bunch of antidepressants and then you give them some ayahuasca, I would guess. Are you upset about what might happen to the rats? Yeah, okay. Um, but the other thing you can do is you can, you can, you can question people, like all those EDV people, uh, to see if there's been, been a reaction. There hasn't been one. Um, now, the dieta has not been studied in any study that I know about. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Charles Grob is the guy who did the Huasca project, which was the first big study into ayahuasca, which he did with Terence McKenna. Uh, I can't remember the date. I think it was in the 80s. So... Yeah, so when you look at the psychological, uh, the psychology investigations, uh, do they ask you, do they ask their subjects if they've taken, uh, if they've been undergoing dietas? No, they don't. I've looked at them. Do they ask them when the last time they had sex was? No, they don't. Do they ask them uh, where you are in your menstrual cycle? No, they don't. They're not interested in anything that the indigenous people have to say about ayahuasca. No, they might be interested in it, but the scientific journals and the scientific community and the various taboos that are in place make it very difficult to publish that kind of thing and perhaps even talk about that kind of thing. Do we need more research? Yes, we do. So, back to indigenous customs or savage customs. The techniques. So, here are the techniques of ayahuasca. Uh, Ikaro, Ikaro, as you probably know, are songs which contain the essence and the power of a particular plant. And the way you get an Ikaro is you spend a long time.